So uh, my name is Harish Ridran. I'm a committed on PMC member on Apache Flume. Unrelated, I'm also a committed on Apache Scoop. Um, I am a software engineer at Cloudera. I've been around at Cloudera for about two and a half years now. Uh, so before we go into what you know, Flume and all of the concepts related to Flume, uh, before we discuss all of that, let's talk about the legacy of Flume. So Flume started off as a Cloudera GitHub project. You know, one guy at Cloudera, when Cloudera was like 15 or 20 people, started hacking on this thing to uh, get data into Hadoop. This was in response to customer complaints that you know, writing a whole lot of data into Hadoop causes the name node to choke when there are MapReduce jobs running. At that time, MapReduce was the only thing. There was no Impala or Drill or any of those fancy uh, systems to actually process data. So today we have MapReduce, Impala, Spark, and a whole lot of other systems which actually process data on HDFS. Turns out when there are so many systems which people have and generally use in an uncoordinated way, what happens is your name node generally gets clogged. Your name node becomes a bottleneck because there are too many connections open to a name node, there are too many files being read from, you know, there are queries being sent to a name node asking for a file, block locations, and stuff like that. So you don't want your name node to get blocked because name node is your single point where everything has to function. Like even if you have a, you know, a secondary name node, it doesn't matter because uh, if your active name node fails, it just fails over to a standby because there's only one single name node which's actually serving client requests at any point in time. So this was before all that happened, before the standby name node came in. All of that stuff, right? So what happened was the project was called Flume at that time, which later became Flume OG. It was a simple project to actually help scale the way writes are done into HDFS. You write to HDFS in a more coordinated and you know, non-bursty way. You send data in, a, in sort of like a steady flow. So FlumoG had a bunch of design issues because it was a single person uh, project. There were you know, issues with the design. There were some implementation issues as well. So turns out two years ago, uh, at that time, you know, around two years ago, the project was also submitted uh, to the Apache incubator. So at that time, the Apache community generally decided it was trying to probably reboot Flume. So at that time, thankfully, Flume had not reached you know, version 1. It was 0.9x. So a good reboot version was version 1.0. So with version 1.0, Flume NG was born. It was born on a specific Jira, Flume 728. And it was you know, created as an experimental project on a, a different branch on the Apache SVN. What uh, Flume NG aimed was the same thing as Flume, get data into HDFS in a scalable way. You know? Don't clog HDFS, but allow a huge number of applications to still write data to HDFS. The only difference was the way in, it, in which it would be done, the implementation. So today, this is a very introductory talk on Flume NG. We'll talk about some of the basic components of Flume NG. And I had a couple of new slides which I'd added to a presentation in the P uh, PPT version. I will make sure to convert it into PDF and upload it uh, on the ApacheCon website. Unfortunately, this version doesn't have it. So um, let's go into more detail here. So what is Flume? Like I said, we wanted to make HDFS, you know, we wanted to allow HDFS to scale. Everyone wanted to do that. And we didn't want rights to HDFS being the cause of HDFS not scaling. So we made sure that the way rights happen, especially when rights are coming from a massive number of applications, say you know, your production front end, your web servers. So when you have so many web servers producing data, you don't want all of them writing data to HDFS at the same time. Primarily because each one of those would have to actually create a single file because of the way HDFS client API is designed. All of them cannot write to the same file. And that means that you have a huge number of connections open from every single web server to HDFS. Guess what happens at that time? You have your name node also serving MapReduce, also serving Impala, also serving Spark. You know what happens. You have, if you have uh, an account with Cloudera, you file a P1 saying your HDFS is down. 
you have an account with Hortonworks, you file it with them. But in the end, you're going to have to file a ticket with someone, even maybe your operations team, who's going to be mad at you. Now, the point of building Flume was exactly the first one, collection and aggregation of streaming data. So this is typically used for log data, but we have, you know, I have seen use cases where the data is not exactly log data, but in general, what it means is that you don't want to be uploading a huge 10 gig file through Flume. You want to be uploading data that is, you know, you can actually quantify it into smaller pieces of data, like a log event, a perfect example, right? Even Log4j, if you know how the internals of Log4j works, Log4j actually makes, you know, builds each log line you see in the log file as a log event. So the way Flume works is exactly the same. You have a smaller quantified piece of data, you write it into HDFS, and it doesn't matter how you write it into HDFS or where it goes because MapReduce or Impala actually process directories than a single file. So now, why is this better than just having your application write your data? Why is this better than having a script, you know, read your log files and then send them over to HDFS? Why do you have to have this weird system sitting in between? If any one of you have used a system like Scribe, you already know the answer. If you have used Kafka, you already know the answer. It's the same answer, right? You want something to be reliable. You want something to be scalable. When you're, you are using that to actually push data into HDFS, and in most cases, you know, what we have realized over the past few years is that log data is actually important. It gives us valuable information. In fact, sometimes, you know, that kind of data, your quantified data could even be a revenue, a revenue stream for you. So you want to make sure that that data ends up in HDFS in a reliable way. You want to scale your HDFS. You want to manage the whole thing. You don't, you know, managing scripts is extremely difficult. With my background, I know that. I have actually done that before, right? You know, I have like an ops team, but there are scripts which my team used to manage, and it's not easy because managing scripts is as difficult because you actually have to use scripts to manage those scripts. So you know what happens in those cases. Another advantage of Flume in general compared to many other systems uh, which actually use streaming data is that with Flume, the way we design the system makes it very easy to configure. Configuration of Flume is actually simply uh, you know, properties, Java properties file. If you are not familiar with Java, properties file is, equal, is pretty much a key value pairs written with an equal to in between, right? It's, it's that simple. It's pretty much how you would represent a hash map if you're writing it on paper, A equals B. Another advantage of, of using Flume over a customized system of your own is contextual routing. Initially, most people don't understand why you need contextual routing. But turns out, you know, more than 50% of our customers who have deployed Flume actually end up using it. Contextual routing is basically a way of looking at your event or looking at the data which is being sent and deciding whether the data has to go to a storage location A or a storage location B. A perfect example is when you have HBase serving real-time client requests and HDFS actually having the raw data itself for later processing. So sometimes you don't want all of your data going into HBase. You just want the high priority ones because that's all your client cares about. You know, your client might be internal or a web service or whatever, right? But if your client doesn't care about all of the data, you don't have to actually send all of the data. So based on the context, the context being the data itself, you could actually say, okay, send this data to both HD, uh, HDFS and HBase. This allows you to say priority one, both places. Priority two, don't go to H, HBase, just go to HDFS. So that's contextual routing. You know, your, your context is your event, and then you decide where it goes. This is sort of like um, a 50 to 60% use case which I've seen. Like most people end up using systems, you know, having either two HDFS clusters, where one which actually want, has to be smaller and higher priority, or one HBase and one HDFS cluster, and they both use uh, contextual routing. There are a whole lot of features, some of them which I already mentioned, some of them which I will mention. The best part about Flume? Practically every component except the Flume framework itself is extensible. You can just throw away the Flume built-in component, like drop the jar into the class path, and say, hey, use this thing instead of your HDFS sync. 
I want to write to HDFS in a better way than you are. If you think that HDF, you can write, you have a specific customizable way to write it. In fact, you don't even have to actually replace the entire component. You can even just replace a part of the component saying, this is how I would serialize my data. Say you want to serialize your data as protocol buffers. Flume doesn't support protocol buffers out of the box to serialize data because protocol buffers in HDFS is not splittable. But turns out your application needs pro protocol buffers. Yeah, go ahead, write a serializer, deploy it, and you'd be writing in protocol buffers because Flume allows you to customize the way you would write your data. This is true for HDFS, this is true for HBase, this is true for Solar, this is true for any of the systems that Flume supports, Elasticsearch, all of those. So now, now that we know what Flume is, how would you actually send data into Flume? Right? You would want to send data into Flume in a way which Flume can understand that this is how the data looks like. So one of the core concepts of Flume is an event. Like I said earlier, event is the fundamental unit of data which Flume transports. Flume doesn't really care what the data is. So an event actually looks like a byte array. It's actually in Java byte array in a different language depending on how Thrift would you know, serialize the data. It would look different, but in Java it's a byte array and Flume doesn't actually look at the data unless you deploy a component that does. So the event has a payload, which is the body of the event, and that is actually just a byte array. There is a bunch of headers. Headers is, in Java, represented as a map of key value pairs. So those are the headers usually you would want to look at for contextual routing. Your, uh, the way Flume looks at context, uh, you know, implements contextual routing is using what is called a multiplexing channel selector. That uses the Flume headers to actually decide where an event goes. Now, headers are unordered. Flume doesn't actually go through an order because it's a hash map, it's not a tree map. It's a hash map in the implementation. So you shouldn't actually expect it to have an order. You shouldn't expect that you know, Flume has already seen one header before going to the next. Headers are used for contextual routing, which is why you want to use, um, you know, you want to populate your headers based on your actual array of your data. So if your data is priority two, you want to put a header that says priority is equal to two or something like that, and you can configure the multiplexing channel selector to actually look at that header and decide where the data goes. Now, you know how the data is, you know, looks like. But really, how do you send the data to Flume? You have the data, you have a Flume agent running, but there's a gap in between. It's your network, right? How do you send the data over the network? Turns out there are multiple ways of doing it. The first and the most important one is actually second on the list. It's the client SDK. So client SDK is like any other networking system you have used, any other system that sends data over a network. There's a small client API which actually talks the language of that system. So Flume uses Avro for communication between uh, Flume agents, you know. But the problem is we use Avro's uh, IPC, which is Java only. So if you're using a Java client, hey, great, you have an SDK available right there. You know, it has a bunch of features. It has load balancing. It has failover. If you're not using Java, really sorry, you have only a thrift, dot thrift file. You'll have to generate your own code and use that code. So depending on how Thrift implements it in Python or in Ruby or whatever language it supports, you would actually have to implement your own client. But best part of it is that because you're using a Thrift, the whole RPC part of it is taken care of. It will give you like a client API, you know, and you have to use that to build your own client. So once you have decided that you have to use Flume, you use the client API in whichever language you, uh, you choose to send your data. The client API is fairly simple. It's sort of like, you know, connect, append, or append batch. That's it, it's like three methods. Now, there are two others in that list. One is the log4j appender. Turns out, most people want to send log files. If you want to send log data, actually, if you want to send log data, it means that in 90% of the cases, if you're using Java, you're probably using log4j. If you're using log4j, there's a log4j appender that comes packaged with Flume. There's a log4j uh, appender that can talk to multiple Flume agents in case one of them is dead, in case you, know, you want to round robin between those agents. So the log4j appender is what you would want to use if you really don't want to write any Flume SDK code. You just want to do this, uh, you know, specify this somewhere in the configuration. 
what you do is log4j appender in your log4j.conf, you would actually specify the log4j appender to use the Flume log4j class. And then you would configure it according to, you know, you say, hey, send data to these machines on this port. And that's where your Flume agents are listening to. Third one is the embedded agent. The client SDK is fairly simple, but there's a problem. If the client SDK can't send data, it'll throw an exception. It'll say, hey, I couldn't send your data. You have to do something about it. Turns out if that's data, if that's data you don't want to lose, your application will have to do a whole lot of buffering. And if your application dies, if you don't actually write that stuff to disk, you're probably going to lose data. So if you're going to lose data, you want to write, if you don't want to lose data, you want to write it to disk, which, turn, which means you're going to implement a write-ahead log. Turns out we spent six to eight months implementing a write-ahead log, which works well. You can use that in the embedded agent. The embedded agent actually embeds an entire Flume agent into your application, which means that it uses up more resources. It'll use up more file descriptors. It'll use up more memory because it has a whole lot of overhead which a Flume agent has. But if you can afford that in your application, I would recommend using the embedded agent over the uh, client SDK because in that case, you have a whole lot of buffering which you don't have to worry about. If your uh, Flume agent dies or the network has gone down, as long as your embedded agent's channel is not full, we'll talk about what a channel is. A channel is a buffer for now. So as long as that is not full, your embedded agent will take care of retries and all those things. You don't have to worry about that. So the idea of a client is to decouple a Flume agent from the machine on which your application is running. You want to run your Flume agent on a different machine because you don't want to actually overload the machine on which your web server is running. Your web server probably already takes up a whole lot of resources. You probably don't have enough resources to run an entire Flume agent. So you basically have to split it up and you move your machine to a different, uh, you move your Flume agent to a different machine so that you know, your application doesn't get hit by the Flume agent's overheads. Now, like I said, you don't need it in all cases. You can use a log4j appender. Guess what? We also support syslog. We also support you know, just sending text over the wire. But you probably want to use a more reliable protocol, which is why the three are, the top three are actually our best examples. Now, we talked about a client. Let's talk about what a Flume agent is, right? I mean, you have a client, but you don't know what a Flume agent is. Flume agent is actually simply a JVM which holds Flume, right? A single JVM is called the Flume agent. The Flume agent has at least three components, sources, channels, and sinks. Now, a Flume agent simply takes events from one place, puts it in another place. So this is the basic deployment unit. If you're deploying Flume, you have to at least deploy a Flume agent. You cannot deploy a part of a Flume agent. A Flume agent has these three components. This is what you configure, you, you know, your system, uh, your lifecycle management, all those go into a single Flume agent. Now, a Flume agent has several components, the, t uh, the top three being sources, channels, and sinks. We'll go into detail uh, for each one of those now. Uh, okay, I, it seems I messed up my slides. But this is sort of how you would aggregate your flows. There is a more detailed version of this in the slides which I'll upload on ApacheCon, which is on my dead laptop. But this is pretty much what a uh, flow looks like. You have your application which has clients writing to the first set of Flume agents. Then you have that writing to a second set of Flume agents, finally going to HDFS. Uh, you know, why, we, why do you have to have a multiple set of Flume agents? The real reason is that you don't want a whole lot of Flume agents writing to HDFS, right? The whole point was to minimize the number of machines writing to HDFS. So you want a minimal number of machines writing to HDFS. Usually I recommend like, you know, a 1 is to 16 ratio. You have like 16 machines writing to HDFS for every HDFS, uh, uh, every HDFS cluster. Now, the more the machines are, the more connections that go to HDFS. Now, because you have a maximum limit on the last year writing to HDFS, you have to put, you may have to put an additional tier if you have a huge number of applications. Because the first tier which receives data from, Flume, uh, from your application, the Flume tier which receives data, actually has a simple NETI server which listens to you, your application and pulls in data why, uh, which is sent by the client API. Now, that will scale only this much because 
you know, scalability has its own limits. So if you have a huge number of applications, say in, your, in hundreds, right, application servers, you would want to have machines, flume machines, receiving data from a smaller set of those applications, which means that you'll have to have a larger number of applications here. Now, again, the flume to flume connections, you don't want it to go beyond limits. You want to limit that number. So basically, by having tiers, you're limiting the number of connections on each of the tiers and HDFS. That's pretty much what tiering does. Um, if you have questions about this, you can ask me in the end, because by then we'll cover a lot more of the topics and you'll be able to understand what this is. I actually had more slides uh, related to this, unfortunately. Again, on my dead laptop. Okay, so I won't cover each of the components, you know, specific components Flume supports, but we'll talk about them in some detail over here. Now, the, when we look at the Flume agent, we actually talked about three components, sources, channels, and sinks. So they're pretty much left to right, right? Now, when you have uh, data coming into Flume, something actually has to receive data. It's just like your HTTP server, right? When you're making a connection to your HTTP server, if you don't have a server running on that port, you won't be actually able to get a connection to that server. You won't be able to send anything, you won't be able to receive anything. So the source is that component which receives the data from your client. It may be via syslog, it may be via Avro, it may be via some other mechanism. Now, each source basically does two things. Receive the data and put it onto a channel. Now, a channel is a buffer. We just talked about it. So if the channel is a buffer, when the Flume agent gets the data and puts it onto a channel, it can actually send a success back to your client saying, I have your data, your data is safe now. Now, what are the different types of sources we support? The simplest sources we support are syslog and netcat. So netcat is basically receive a bunch of text. Syslog actually does some formatting of the syslog data and you know removes a bunch of headers and puts them into Flume headers so that you can use it for prioritized routing and stuff like that. There are some sources which automatically generate a bunch of data, like an exec source. Exec source is actually one of the key sources which a lot of people use if they want to actually tail files, right? So what exec source does is it basically executes an external process and pulls the output of that process into the, Flume, uh, into the Flume agent line by line. A sequence generating source is what most people use to test anything other than the source. It basically just generates a random sequence from one to n or whatever. Now, Flume uses uh, IPC to talk between Flume agents and to receive data. The IPC Flume uses between Flume agents is Abro's uh, you know, the Netty Avro IPC format. So this is scalable. We have actually tested it a whole lot, and we know that this works. So generally, for flume-to-flume -flume communication, we recommend using Avro, though we actually support Thrift. But in general, we, uh, we tell people to use Thrift only if you're sending data from another format, uh, another language. Now, there are several sources. I don't even know how many sources we have bundled into Flume. I think we have more sources than any other component. The most important sources are spooling file source, JMS source, Avro, and thrift source. So spooling file source is something that we recommend instead of using the exec source uh, with a tail minus F, because of the simple reason that the spooling file source will not lose data even if you are you know, agent restarts, even if your JVM crashes and you have to restart your Flume agent. So why tail minus F doesn't work is that tail minus F actually is executing outside of the Flume agent. So if the Flume agent fails, the tail minus F is still gonna continue, right? Or if you restart Flume, you are gonna restart tail minus F and you're probably gonna restart from a different location because a whole lot of data just got written to your files. So whatever was written in between those, you know, the time the Flume agent went down and the Flume agent restarted may not end up in HDFS. So spooling file source is actually a more reliable way of doing this. What you would do is do the normal log4j stuff, write it into your log file. When your, you know, your log file gets rotated by log4j, move that into a different directory which Flume is actually keeping an eye on. So every event written to that directory will be pulled in by the spooling file source. 
Now, because it's pulling file source, pulls in every directory, uh, every file uh, in that directory. What it also does, it persists the location of the last few events. You know, the last event it actually pushed to HDFS or push, uh, push to, you know, solar. So when you restart, if the Flume agent restarts, it knows where to restart from. It does not lose data. JMS source actually pulls data from anything that supports a JMS format. We have extensively tested this with ActiveMQ. It works pretty well with ActiveMQ. I've heard that with some tweaking, it also works with RabbitMQ. I have not tested personally. I don't know uh, of anyone actually using it with RabbitMQ, but it works, theoretically works with anything that supports JMS. Now, JMS source is quite important if you have legacy systems which use JMS to push data. You don't want to t take your you know, legacy system and then change it and all that. You can use the JMS source to receive the data from the JMS broker, and it'll push the data into Flume. Now, like we mentioned, Flume uses agent to agent communication. Flume uses um, Avro IPC. But if you have data being sent from other languages, you know, Python and systems like that, you want to use Thrift. Flume also has an HTTP source. So sometimes if, you're, you know, if your company is standardized on REST format, if your company uses JSON, you don't want to actually include Thrift also because if you use Thrift source, your application has a dependency on Thrift. So you could use HTTP source. Uh, HTTP source is, again, simply a web server which pulls in data via HTTP into a Flume channel and then pushes it out into HDFS or HBase. Each source at least requires one channel to function. It should have been obvious by now because Flume uh, sources actually get data from something and then writes it out to, it, uh, to a channel. So without a channel, it actually cannot function. The Flume uh, configuration system takes care of it. It'll actually validate if it has a channel attached to it. If it doesn't have a channel, it just throws away that, uh, that source and says, hey, I couldn't initiate this source because of this reason. Now, we talked about channels a whole lot. What's a channel? A channel is simply a buffer. Flume sources write to a channel. Now, channels are passive. It doesn't mean that they may not run, it, uh, run their own threads, but they don't actually push or pull data. You actually put data into a channel, and then you pull data out of the channel. It's pretty much like a queue. A queue doesn't do a whole lot of fancy stuff, but you could write a queue implementation that you know, is uh, off heap and then does some sort of cleanup using a thread every few hours or every few minutes or whatever, right? So the same thing, the Flume, uh, a Flume channel is a passive component, but it may run its own threads if it has some cleanup to do, like the file channel. So now, there are, in general, we tell people not to implement their own channels because it's extremely difficult to actually get all of the semantics of a channel right. Because the, the durability of a Flume uh, agent actually depends on the Flume channel. If the channel actually is durable, the data will be there if your machine restarts. Now, let's look at the two channels which come bundled with Flume. One is a memory channel. A memory channel is pretty much a glorified queue. It's in memory, you write the data, it goes into a memory channel, it goes into you know, a heap location, you pull out of the heap, it just goes away. Data is lost if the JVM or the machine restarts, right? So if you have really sensitive data which you don't want to lose, don't use a memory channel. The memory channel will lose data if uh, the machine restarts. The file channel, on the other hand, is backed by a write-ahead wall, a write-ahead log, a wall. So this is a pretty uh, interesting piece of code. We actually took a whole lot of time to actually make sure it is performant and it is correct. So we know for a fact that this is pretty high performance if you actually configure it correctly. And I have not had an instance in the past year or so where this has actually lost data. Before that, it wasn't even a stable component. We, we said that it's stable around December of 2012 or something like that. And I have not heard of a situation where the file channel actually lost data other than by user error where somebody actually went and deleted a bunch of files which the file channel was using to store the data. Now, there is a caveat, though. The file channel actually writes to disk. If your disk dies, the data is lost, unfortunately, because of the fact that file channel does not support mirroring by itself. So if you want to do mirroring, if you want to make sure that the data is not lost if a disk dies, you probably want to raid it or, you know, <coughs> use some other mechanism to make sure your disk is replicated. Now, eventually, if your agent comes back up, you know, suppose your agent dies, it comes back up, 
the data in the file channel is available again. So your data may not be available for the time the agent is down. So when the agent comes back up, the data will become available again. So maximum you would see is a delay, not a data loss itself. Ch uh, each channel is fully transactional. Transactions are the key to Flume's no data loss guarantee. So what it does is, you know, every time data is being written to uh, a channel by the source, source actually opens a transaction, writes the data, commits a transaction, then sends out a success to the sync or the system that wrote the data. So because of that, you can sort of have overlapping transactions to ensure that only when the source commits its transaction, the sync will actually commit transaction, otherwise it would retry. In the absence of failures, this channel will actually, uh, you know, both the Flume channels will actually release data in the same order as the data went in. So if you put events in a specific order, it would be the same order in which the events actually come out. So you cannot use this for strict ordering because if there is a failure or if the channel runs full, there would be rollbacks and stuff like that, in which case your data loss, uh, your data is not going to be in the same order. Your data won't be lost, your data will be in a different order, slightly different usually. And all channels are actually heavily concurrent. So provided your, your system has enough resources for it and you're not, you, know, you have disks that are pretty concurrent support, uh, which have pretty good concurrent support, you can actually use multiple sources and multiple syncs. We talked about a channel. Now, what's a sync? Now, the component that puts data into a Flume channel is the source. A sync is the component that actually takes it out. It's a buffer, like I said, right? The channel is a buffer. So you want to make sure that any data written to it is actually eventually taken out. Otherwise, your buffer becomes full, and then you can't write any more data. So your writes happen from the source. Your reads happen from syncs. The syncs are the components which either send data from one Flume agent to another or to a different destination, right? So when you have HDFS, when you have HBase, you have an HDFS sync that writes data to HDFS. You have an HBase sync that writes data to HBase. Now, we generally categorize uh, syncs into two types, terminal syncs and IPC syncs. Terminal syncs are the syncs that actually write data to the eventual destination. So there are a whole lot of terminal syncs. The more important ones are HDFS, HBase, Morphline Solar, and Elasticsearch. So like I mentioned, you have syncs that write data to HDFS. You can have syncs that write data to HBase. These are all bundled with Flume. Morphline Solar Sync actually uses CloudRAM Morphlines, now Kite Morphlines, to modify your data in such a way that you, know, you can do some uh, heavyweight ETL processing with the components that Morphline already supports, and then eventually load your data into Solar for indexing. If your Solar, uh, if your solar Cloud is actually on HDFS, then you're actually not running a bunch of you know, different systems. You can just write data to Solar, and Solar would write it to HDFS. So usually what you do is you would send data via one sync to Solar and the other sync to HDFS to preserve your raw data, which you have not actually transformed so that this, it's searchable. Now, all of these syncs support multiple serialization formats. There are multiple serialization formats which come out of the box. You can just specify that in the configuration and that uh, those serialization formats are taken care of right away. But suppose you want your own custom serialization format, it's a pretty simple Java interface you have to just implement, drop it into a class path, and specify in the configuration, use that serializer. HBase, uh, HBase syncs actually support the same thing. You would convert those into HBase puts and increments. Morphline Solar, you would actually use it by writing your own Morphline. You would use your, uh, you'd write your own morph line that transforms the events into the serialization format you want, and then eventually write it in that format. Like we said, agent-to-agent -agent communication is using Avro or Thrift. And every sync can actually take data only from one channel. So if you have a whole lot of sources writing data to one channel and you want to send all of that to uh, HDFS sync, you could simply have one sync reading from that channel. Usually more syncs, the data goes in faster because each sync actually gets exactly one thread. So to improve concurrency, you have multiple, uh, you have multiple syncs reading from the same channel. So earlier I was talking about flow reliability, right? How do you make sure that there is, your data is not lost when it's being sent over the wire? This is how we do that. 
each sync opens a transaction with its own channel, reads a bunch of events, sends them out to the source on the next tier. Now, when the source receives the events, the source actually opens its own transaction with its own channel, writes it out, commits that event. Once that is committed, it's only at that point that the source responds to the sync saying, I successfully uh, wrote your data. So your sync could time out, your sync could actually get an error message, in which case you'd simply roll back, the sync would simply roll back the transaction with its own channel. Now if the sync rolls back the transaction, what happens is the channel actually puts the events back into the buffer. The channels in, are written in such a way that any e uncommitted transactions, the events in that uncommitted transaction are never lost. They're just put back into the channel and made available again. So this is how we guarantee reliability. This works pretty well. It actually even scales well. Now, your channel has to be on disk to make sure that even if the machines die or whatever, right, your data is still available. Now, you could do this in a load balancing and failover way where each set of events is actually written to a different set of uh, Flume agents based on how you configure it. So this allows you to basically make sure that if one destination Flume agent is down for some reason, you can still write data to a different agent. So this is what I was talking about. What happens is when the first one shows regular flow, right? Your data is not lost when there's regular flow. It, there's this buffer in between. The source keeps putting it. The sink keeps taking out. Now, imagine what happens when one of those agents dies. When one of the agents dies, your sink is continuously trying to write data to it, but it can't. So the local buffer on that, the local channel on that starts filling up. Once that channel fills up, that source is no longer able to ac uh, accept any data. The source starts saying, hey, I can't accept data. Sorry about it. At that point, the source sends an error message back, and the next tier starts filling up. So you know, eventually, when the communication and when your agents get restored and they start functioning again, the whole pipeline starts clearing up from one end and eventually allowing the system to return to steady state. The sinks are designed to retry automatically. You don't have to actually you know, do anything fancy in your sink. The sinks will retry by itself. The framework will take care of that. Now, the idea of a buffer is pretty much the same thing as your regular application, right? Why do you have a buffer? It is to make sure that whatever is producing the data does not get blocked by whatever is taking the data. It's a classic producer-consumer problem. You want to separate the concerns of each of the components. So when your upstream system, when your application during peak hours produces a whole lot of data, it'll just get buffered in the channel until the sink is able to uh, you know, remove it. So the buffer aspect of a channel of a Flume agent is exactly the same as buffer aspect of your regular application. You just want to buffer your data until it's removed. Now, this also has the additional impact that if your HDFS, uh, you know, HDFS becomes unavailable, the network connection goes down, or something else happens, and you can't write the data to HDFS, you have an additional period for which your agents, uh, your Flume agents will buffer the data and your application doesn't even know about the HDFS failure. That is what you would do in capacity planning. So when you want a capacity plan, you basically see how long you want to plan your downtime for and then say, hey, I produce X events per second, so I would want this much of a buffer, right? Which is basically the downtime multiplied by your production rate. You usually want to use your peak production rate. And then you say, oh, that's the number of events my entire Flume, uh, Flume application system, you know, all of the Flume tiers have to together buffer, which means that that is the number of events all of your channels should in total be able to handle. Now, this is uh, the most important part of the capacity planning. I won't talk about capacity planning today, but last year, Arvind Prabhakar talked about Flume capacity planning in ApacheCon. You can find the slides online. You can actually look it up there. So like I said, configuration is a Java properties file. I won't go into too much detail of what Java properties file is, but this is pretty much how it looks like. The configuration is hierarchical. So you specify agent one as an agent name when you start up your Flume agent. And then you, when you say, hey, the Flume agent which is being started up is agent one, that Flume agent will only go and look at the configuration for agent one, which is specified as the first part of your configuration file. And then you say dot channels dot my channel dot type. So each of that is sort of like a 
a prefix to the previous part. And so when you say channels, that means that these are the channels which are being represented. And now my channel is the specific channel you're talking about. So it's pretty intuitive from that, right? It's agent one, you're talking about the channels, you're talking about a specific channel, and then you're talking about a parameter for that channel. It's the same for sources and sinks. You'd say dot sources, dot source name, dot port, or dot host name. So what that would do is the last part of the whole thing would get passed down to your individual component. The, the part before that is for the Flume agent to understand who to pass that configuration to. So each of these parameters basically gets broken down into sub, sub context and sub context and sub context and then eventually gets passed down to each of the components. Sometimes the components use, you know, go further to actually have co configuration for sub components within the component, like a serializer for the HDFS sync. So you would, for the HDFS sync, you would actually say HDFS sync dot serializer. So that would get passed down to the serializer and the HDFS sync would simply ignore it. So basically the idea is you could make it as hierarchical as you want based on the component you're using. But in general, each of the configurations would look like this. Now, this is sort of how a Flume, uh, you know, general Flume uh, workflow would look like. So now, if you look at it, you have multiple Flume uh, agents, and most probably they're gonna have different configurations. You don't wanna be handling like 15 configuration files, right? It's gonna be a pain, your ops team is gonna complain. Which is why Flume has an agent name. So because the Flume agent gets started with a specific name, and that agent would only look for the configuration with that name, you can actually easily configure all of these machines with a single file. You just specify a different agent name for each of these. Usually tier one, all of the tier one uh, machines would have the same file name, uh, or same agent name, which means that you can start all of them with the same file. The other set would have similar names, so you could actually start them with the similar agent name. Now, earlier we had mentioned contextual routing. Contextual routing is done using a channel selector, and the default channel selector is multiplexing channel selector. So if you, uh, sorry, repl uh, replicating channel selector. If you sub uh, mention multiple channels for a single source, what would happen is the source would simply replicate all of that data into all of those channels, which allows you to write every single piece of data to different destinations, because you would have syncs reading from those channels. Now, sometimes you would want to look at the events, make some changes, maybe drop some events. So for that, Flume supports what's called an interceptor chain. Interceptors are simple components which you can implement by yourself or use a bunch of the uh, interceptors which come bundled with Flume. You could even use that to prioritize your events. So you basically modify the events or drop the events in an interceptor, then it gets forwarded to a channel. So at that point, the interceptor, whatever modification the interceptor does, is seen by the selector which sel decides where to write the events to. So an interceptor is pretty much a simple component which can modify an event. It can modify or drop an event. Unfortunately, an interceptor cannot add new events. This is just a protection against uh, you know, a bad piece of code just filling up your channel. So each batch has 10 events. You would actually be able to write only 10 events. Batch sizes are configurable. 10 is just an example. So you would actually have either 10 or less than 10 events. You could replace the original events. That's up to you but you cannot create more events. Now, built-in interceptors actually allow you to create new timestamps, you know, insert timestamps, host names, static markers, and stuff like that. These can be used to bucket events in HDFS. Usually that's used to make sure that, you know, at the end of one hour, your data, data gets loaded into Hive or Impala. So you have a cron job that sits there and monitors a file, you know, a folder, and at the end of one hour, takes everything in that directory, loads it to Hive or Impala for processing. So these are, you know, you can use your configuration system to actually say use these headers in my, uh, in my HDFS path. Now custom interceptors can actually be used for more complex, you know, proprietary processing. They don't come bundled with Flume, obviously, that's why they're called custom. But the idea is that if you just drop it into your jar, uh, the jar into your class path and then mention the name of the custom interceptor in your configuration, you can use that with a source. So contextual routing, like I mentioned, is moving your data based on the content of your data, right, content of your event. Now, the multiplexing channel selector uses headers for this. You can specify which header to use. You can look at the value of that header and decide where the data goes. 
So multiplexing channel selector also has a default. If the value of the header doesn't match any of your prefixed values, then you would just push it into any, uh, you know, into a default one. Now the terminal sinks can also use uh, headers for dynamic, dynamically deciding where the data goes. An example is HDFS. HDFS can look at your timestamp and then push events into timestamps based on parameters, which are regular expressions. You can see more details about that in the Flume user guide. You have a bunch of regular expressions which Flume will support, and this allows you to bucket data into, you know, hour-based or host name based uh, directories so that you can actually load them into Hive easier. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to quickly run through this. So load balancing and failover is something that we talked about earlier. They're supported through sync processors on the sync side. So each sync processor, uh, you know, you have a sync group which actually has multiple syncs in it, and a sync processor processes these syncs in some order specified by configuration. You could actually go through it round robin. You can go through it randomly. But if a sync is failed, you know, a sync fails when the connection to the destination source is failed. So now if that sync is failed, you, it would actually automatically retry the next one in order. It would actually, you know, roll back the transaction only if every sync is failed. If every sync is failed, probably your ops team will call you anyway, because there are a bunch of machines which are down. So sync processor sort of works this way. It basically selects a sync. It should have really been called sync selector, but, you know, it is called sync processor, unfortunately. It selects one of the sinks to actually process events. So if that sink processes the events, it will just go down, start a new transaction. If it doesn't, it tells a different sink to process events. This is usually done to make sure that you have, uh, you know, failover and load balancing. Sync processor configuration is done using what is called a sync group. A sync group is basically a group of sinks out of which only one sink is active, and the sync processor decides how that sink, you know, which sink is selected. The client API, like we mentioned, sends a batch of events to a Flume agent. Currently, the client API is Java only. If you want non-Java, you should use the thrift uh, uh, file, which comes bundled. You know, it's on Git, so you can actually just take the uh, thrift file and generate the source in your own language. And you should just use it with the thrift source. An embedded agent, we already mentioned it, it has a channel, which means that it can buffer events even within your application if a Flume agents are down. The embedded agent actually supports exactly one source, which is called the embedded source, which basically just is uh, an API it says put and put all. It just takes that, puts it onto a channel, returns access of failure. Now, it cushions your applications for longer than the uh, you know, SDK because it actually can support downtime for, uh, you know, for a longer period. Now, this is all I have for now, and since we have out of time, I cannot go into the details of how you would do uh, uh, you know, multiple tiers and stuff like that. I have a few slides in the presentation I'm going to upload, so you can actually look it up, and it has some more detail. If you have any questions, you have about a minute. Primarily because it's maintained. Scribe is no longer maintained, first thing. Second thing, Scribe is the basic concept, but there are a whole lot of issues with Scribe in terms of scalability. If you have actually tried to use Scribe at scale, it starts complaining primarily because of the way it serializes stuff. It serializes everything as a string, which is expensive. You're, you're spending a whole lot of resources trying to convert your string into your whatever format and then process it. Second thing, the idea is similar. Scribe is a message passing system. The point of Flume was to design something that is specifically meant for Hadoop or HDFS. It was originally meant for HDFS. We added HBase and all those things. So it was written in a way that you know, HDFS supports. Like the HDFS sync is feature rich. You can actually configure the HDFS sync to write into buckets which can easily be read by Hive. So the idea is similar, but the implementation is different. If you look at Kafka, Kafka does the same thing, right? Like move data from one place to another. The only thing that is different is the way Kafka does it. Kafka is a broker, you pull from the broker. Flume has more of a push uh, method. It's, you know, you have multiple systems. They all do the same thing, but it's done in a different way. It's just like saying, hey, you can do a whole lot of data mining in uh, Cassandra or whatever. You can do the same thing in HBase. It's just the implementation that differs and the guarantees. Yes, so we don't have something built in. We don't have uh, a stream processing system built into the uh, Flume, but there is a GitHub project, which is a Storm connector. 
So you could essentially take that, and there's a configuration example on, uh, on the GitHub project itself. You could use that to connect to Storm. Uh, there is, so, so Spark supports uh, Flume out of the box. There is a Spark uh, Flume RDD, so you could use a Flume RDD to pull data from Flume. There's a Spark sync that works with the Flume RDD. So yes, you can connect to stream processing systems. I don't know uh, of a whole lot of people doing that, but you know, there are a lot of companies which don't tell what they're doing. So yeah, I know for one there is at least, there's only a, you know, at least a handful of people actually doing the Storm one, because I've seen quite a bit of activity on the Storm connector on GitHub. <coughs> Unfortunately, no, we don't, because of the fact that when failures happen, there are cases where we cannot actually support reliability, especially with timeouts, because we don't know if the data actually got sent. The data may have gotten sent, but it just timed out. It might have been slow network. We just retry. For the, so Flume's guarantee is at least once. In general, without failure, you wouldn't have multiple, uh, you know, you wouldn't end up having uh, duplicates. Again, you could configure Flume to create duplicates. So if your configuration is wrong, you could essentially get Flume uh, duplicates. You, know, you could replicate to multiple channels and have multiple syncs writing to the same HDFS cluster. You got duplicates right there. So configuration is one aspect of it. Failure is the other aspect of it. All right, uh, we're about out of time, so let's take part to our great talk. Thank you.